Hello, I am Michael Marsh, and welcome to the program dedicated to reestablishing constitutional government. Now, the Constitution is already on the books. <laughs> you know, it's public policy officially. Every politician takes an oath to uphold the Constitution when they enter office. A lot of them don't actually honor the Constitution once they get there. That's why I do this program, and I invite various candidates on that I think will uphold the Constitution. One of them is uh, Patty Milne, and I want to congratulate you, Patty, for your uh, victory in the uh, mm -hmm. primary. Thank you. And uh, so, what are your plans now? How are you? How's it going now? Well, thank you for bringing that up. And, you know, I was so surprised <laughs> the Statesman Journal even called it a landslide victory. Well, it was. It was 83 um, percent. So that was very nice. That's the first phase, the first step in winning in November. So we're just very focused on keeping the campaign moving and doing the things we need to do to win. And uh, it's going extremely well. It's it's just great. It's, it's, um, the support has just been heartwarming and uh, it's very exciting to be out talking with people. That's good. Um, I understand you were at a CIDCOR uh, meeting uh, the other day. Uh, would you tell, like to tell us first off who CIDCOR is and uh, you know, what, what that event was about? Uh, thank you. Um, economic development has always been one of my top priorities um, and what I've focused on particularly most recently as a county commissioner for 15 plus years and I was um, a member of said Corps as a Marion County Commissioner. I also served on the executive committee um, at said Corps. So uh, I was particularly pleased to be in attendance um, this last Monday for the SEDCOR Honors Lunch. And SEDCOR is the um, economic development organization in the Salem, uh, Salem Polk County area. And uh, Salem, Marion, Salem, Marion County, Polk County um, region. And um, there were several honors and I thought if I could take this opportunity today to um, mention again who the winners were because it, it's such a great representation of good work in our community and the importance of economic development. Um, Pacific Power was the uh, community service um, winner, um, long, long time business um, and utility in the area. Um, AKT, uh, they are local um, certified public accountants and, and advisors. Uh, they won the Business Partner Award. They have over 300 employees um, all together um, in the in region, and actually I think their region um, includes parts of California. But they are a local company. They began in 1973 and, of course, have grown substantially. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a public-private partnership um, award, and this was a little unusual from, um, I think, some in, in the past. And this went to what is known as the Discovery Pavilion at the Oregon Garden, and Rich Duncan, Rich Duncan Construction, was involved in that. So um, they were there. Uh, innovative product of the year went to Stefan Systems. And they, too, are a company that began back in the 70s and um, are now do business internationally. They, um, in particular, when we talk about um, small businesses and people starting a business in the, in the basement, in the garage, <laughs> or whatever, and, and Stefan Systems did actually, back in, in the 1970s, um, they did start out in a 2,400 square foot shop. Now, and that's why I have to look at my notes here, now they're on seven acres and a 60, 60,000 square foot facility. <laughs> so it, it's um, possible. The agribusiness um, of the year winner went to Durfler Farms. Um, they're a grass seed farmer. 
been here for generation, multi-generation family, and outstanding Construction Alliance member. In SEDCOR, there is what is known as the Construction Alliance, and they're doing a lot of work um, uh, with local schools and, and just raising some standards, competency levels, providing skills, helping businesses with that. And um, that started, um, oh gosh, a few years ago with 12 businesses being involved in that, and now there are 90. So that's an effort uh, that's been very successful and has grown. And Rick Day, with the owner of Advanced Precast, was the, the winner <laughs> of being the Outstanding Construction Alliance member. And then, um, Finally, the big winner or, um, of the day, the manufacturer of the year went to Modern Building Systems. They too, longtime family business. So that's what I <laughs> <laughs> that's what I love about this because um, family businesses are so important to our local economy, and um, they they have uh, been uh, distinguished in being the longest continuously operating manufacturer, uh, manufacturing business on the West Coast. Wow, that, <laughs> that's tremendous. And uh, they um, are out in the Almsville area um, uh, where they have their production lines and it, it's just um, tremendous. So I was, again, I was really pleased to be there and. And it was um, a little bittersweet because as I have left um, my county position, um, I will not be sitting on that board of director directors anymore, although I intend to, to remain very, very actively involved in economic development issues um, with these businesses and, and help in any way possible. And when I win the election in November, um, continuing to work on behalf of, of uh, business, especially small business, is where I, I want to put a lot of time and attention. So um, so it was great. And You're then they even gave me a nice little little uh, plaque kind of thing, <laughs> thanking me for my long service and dedication to business. So That's good. Um, I understand you also uh, went on a farm tour. Yes, it's been That's a busy right. week. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, yes. And Along with economic development, of course, our agricultural industry are in Marion County. It is our um, biggest interest. It's our number one industry uh, in Marion County. And uh, so that's another area because they're so important to our local economy and provide jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and our food. <laughs> food is very important. I like and our, food. <laughs> and our food. Um, but you know, a couple of interesting things that um, uh, were mentioned yesterday, and, and quite frankly, I didn't know this statistic, um, the specifics statistic. The food that's um, produced here in the Willamette Valley and in Marion County, um, in Oregon, 80%, um, I knew there that, it, that the percentage was um, high, but um, the reminder yesterday that 80% of what is produced leaves the state. So that means only 20% is staying here, and yes, we want to buy locally, and we want to support our, um, our local farms, and, and of course it's great fresh produce. Yeah. Um, but 80% leaves the state, and then of that 80%, half of it goes overseas. So we're feeding the world. <laughs> <laughs> so that was um, a great, um, uh, a great uh, day, too, and reminder of uh, the importance of um, agriculture and all the related industries and businesses. That's good. Um, one problem that small businesses and farms, family farms have <coughs> is the government, <coughs> state, both state and federal policy of uh, the inheritance tax. Uh, yeah. That goes back, Magna Carta, they had a plank saying when a man <coughs> dies, the uh, 
king and the sheriffs will no longer uh, steal from the uh, the property of you know from the widow and orphans, but we've gone back to stealing from mm -hmm. widows and orphans. Uh, where do you stand on uh, the inheritance tax? Uh, would you like to abolish it, modify it, leave it as it is? Uh, you know, interestingly, yesterday on on this um, agriculture tour, um, a question was asked about that, and I, I don't know that the farmers themselves have and 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 it have the issue of inheritance tax especially um, affects them because there are so many assets and there are so many, meaning a variety of, of properties and buildings, facilities, equipment, et, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was brought out that this, I, I, let me just say um, briefly, I think the tax is not equitable the tax and whatever relief recent legislative sessions the legislature has tried to provide, especially in the agricultural industry, it isn't working the way it could. So should it be at least modified, I would say yes. The problem is, as I just mentioned, it, it, it's, it's not very broad. The application isn't very broad. And so, for example, a farmer owns a, a farm f facility here in Oregon. They may also have one in California. Maybe, maybe they're a farmer down in southern, <laughs> southern Oregon, also have property in California. So then you have different laws there. So it complicates their tax situation and, and their, the planning, their um, estate planning that they do. Um, that was brought out. And, and then the cost today of just doing business in the agricultural industry is so astronomical. Um, one of the farmers, a young lady, a younger generation farmer, was going through with us uh, various fees. Um, there's a fee for this, there's a fee for that, there's a, a certification fee for this, there's a registration fee for that. And just in the matter of a minute or so in my head, I'm adding this up, and pretty soon she's at $2,000 just like that, just for annual fees to, to generalize. And everybody's going, wow. Then we get into a discussion, these monster vehicles that farmers use, these gigantic vehicles that they need to do their business, and you're looking at one of them's 350,000 brand new, another one's a half a million, and another one is, is you know, a little more than that or less than that. And you, you look at this farm and these three, four, five vehicles to run their business, their farm operation, you're talking millions of dollars just sitting there. Yeah. And that's think about how much money that is and they haven't even gotten out into the field yet to to um, either plant the crop or to harvest the crop so um, the cost of doing business is just um, astronomical and so much of their revenue is out of their control if they work with a um, a food processor a cannery they're at the mercy of what they're told to plant, and then of course at the mercy of Mother Nature or when it's going to be harvested and the quality of the crop, the, the um, quantity um, that they get in that particular growing season. Um, it's just really difficult. And the other part that um, uh, is affecting uh, agricultural families and generational farms is a lot of younger people don't want to get into farming because <laughs> they see how difficult it is. And uh, all these costs that continue to be more and more challenging. So uh, it, it's very expensive to be a farmer and yeah. the profit margins are getting smaller and smaller. And Now, talk about all these regulations and it brings up a couple issues, but one of which is 
are these all of these regulations necessary? And secondly, uh, can your legislature let you're going to be a state senator? Hopefully, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll have my vote. You, I'm in your <laughs> district. Um, but there's a you know the legislature passed a law, and the Constitution says they're supposed to be the ones passing the law. But then the executive branch through bureaucracies pass administrative rules which are in effect laws and you know for every page of what you do there's going to be a thousand pages mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. bureaucracy rules. Um, can you cut down some of that? Is it really all necessary? Is it time to cut down, maybe even repeal some of it? Oh, I think <laughs> First of all, as you as you say, there's there are way too many regulations. Um, my filter, my guide is health and safety, and we all want. Um, if we're talking about farming, if we're talking about any industry, manufacturing, even service industries, we want employees and employers to be safe on the job, and. Uh, don't want any health risks or safety problems, so that's fine. When, when regulations can't meet that criteria, um, very likely they are just regulations to try to get more money uh, to fund government or to grow government or to control the business operation. Very often a regulation mandates that the business owner, the employees on the job, do certain things in a certain manner, and it's often just to push, um, to, to push um, a business to do things a certain way because someone has determined that's the best way to do it, and then the business owner has no control how to run his or her business, and not necessarily uh, the best, the easiest, the most profitable way to provide the service or the product. And uh, so regulations need to be looked at much, much more closely, have a much more in-depth discussion about why the regulation is being um, proposed, bring the business community in especially, and, and when I say bring the business community, I mean those business owners um, who, or the people who carry out the, the job, how it, let, let them tell us how this will affect them. Um, how does it affect the health and safety criteria that I, that I use? And if it doesn't, um, whoever is proposing the regulation needs to present a good case of why it's, it's needed. And uh, if, if, uh, if we're just looking at trying to bring in more revenue to fund government, that's not a good enough reason <laughs> to, to, no. to smother p these companies with, with more. Mm -hmm. And, and I, hear, um, I hear a lot from business owners, particularly small businesses. And in Oregon, we're 95, 98% of the businesses are in fact truly that very, very small, the mom pop, yeah. the individual owner, maybe one or two employees, and, and when an owner has to fill out massive documentation and paperwork, they say, we can't do our job because so much time is spent on meeting regulations that really serve no purpose to the product they're producing or the service they're providing takes away from doing the job at hand. And that's the thing I, I hear over and over again. That's what needs to be checked. Good. Um, one issue uh, hasn't been brought up, although the Democrats, they're talking about a $15 an hour minimum wage, uh, which is kind of insane, but I think. Uh, but few years ago when they they imposed it on farms, which, mm -hmm. you know, farm, they sell a product they don't sell <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. um, plus, there's a, I don't know about the Woodburn part of your district, but in Salem there's a lot of 
path food industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you agree with the Democrats that the uh, minimum wage should be fifteen dollars? Should it be where it is lowered, abolished? Uh, where do you stand on uh, minimum wage? Well, Oregon already has one of the highest minimum <laughs> wages in the country, and uh, when when uh, that minimum wage continues to um, to erode the profit margins of a business, and you mentioned fast food restaurants, these owners have, again, so many regulations that they have to comply with, whether they be federal, state, or even the franchise that they're a part of. There's, there's, not, there's not much room in, in their bottom line. And um, these kinds of jobs, you know, I want to see more young people um, it, working. I want to see more teenagers working and learning some basic job skills and, and earning that, that money for the extras. And in some families, money that's really, really necessary to help the family budget. We have a lot of families where the kids really have to work to just help mom and dad and so the, the, the student um, can buy his or her, you know, the gas for the car <laughs> if they're lucky enough to have a car, um, where, th where the student can help mom and dad with um, athletic equipment if they're participating in athletic athletics um, uh, in, uh, in whatever is necessary you know, in that family. Um, the, there's another issue along with this minimum wage, and that's the idea of having a training wage. And I've been very, very interested in that for a long time because that gets to my concern about um, job opportunities for young people. And um, I think we really, really need to look at that because then we can separate uh, young first-time workers from adults who are working at minimum wage. They really, to me, ought to be two separate discussions. Um, and again, like I say, give, give young people, give teenagers the opportunity to get their foot in the door of having job experience, learning basic skills and earning some money, um, save money to go to college or mm. buy the car that they feel they need, um, just help the family the overall family income. Okay. Um, now, speaking of education, uh, some people, you know, right now, it, it's kind of breaking up a little bit, but there's still this box door mentality mm -hmm. in education. Uh, do you think there, although there is some move toward charter schools, but, and while the Oregon Constitution says that, you know, education is supposed to be provided for, one, should it be mandated? I had a 16-year-old relative. She was living with me for a while, and her mom got in trouble because I wasn't making her go to school. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> um, but uh, should the money go for education or should it go to the bureaucracy? And right now it's going to the bureaucracy. Uh, how should our education dollars be spent? I would love to see every student have more educational opportunity. And what I mean by that is uh, to explain, explain it, we all know that um, uh, disadvantaged uh, or um, disabled students, um, students with special needs um, have what's called an individual education plan. And there are a lot of extra dollars that go to those individuals so their educational experience meets their needs. Wonderful. <laughs> it's, it really is. It's great. And we need to do that. Why shouldn't every student have that opportunity? Yeah. <laughs> and so what I mean by every student having an individual education plan, just to use that as a way to explain my theory, 
we have today, you mentioned it, of course, there, there is the traditional schoolhouse in the neighborhood, sometimes in the neighborhood, although today many students, there might be a, a school they could walk to two <laughs> blocks away, but because of needing to make sure every, every school meets all these, um, um, uh, what am I, the, the criteria and fits very neatly into balancing socioeconomic and all that, um, often a, a student is bused to a school that's actually outside the neighborhood, and that's really too bad. But um, so there's the traditional school and the school building. There are also charter schools. Sometimes those schools are within an existing elementary or an existing high school. Sometimes they're located in a separate building just because um, of what the program actually entails and the availability of space. There, today we also have um, a lot of internet classes, online classes for a lot of age groups, um, a lot of great opportunities um, for kids to learn outside of the traditional schoolhouse. Also, it's becoming more and more popular um, for high school students. Uh, there are m many programs and variations of getting credit, high school credit, and at the same time, community college credit. And I think all that's great, too. I have one child who did that in high school. And in fact, we were the, the uh, trailblazers <laughs> in getting the Woodburn High School many years ago um, to coordinate with the local community at the Chemeketa Community College to do those kinds of programs. It was great. Um, there are also, there's also a, a tremendous need. There's a lot of discussion. And in fact, Salem-Kaiser is in the process of working with a uh, uh, vocational. So the listeners <laughs> might be able to better understand if the, um, the words they're using is escaping me at the moment. But to get back to offering more vocational training for the variety of jobs that are out there, and I think that's a great, great opportunity. Um, in Salem-Kaiser, we've not had many of those opportunities. And um, I was talking just yesterday to a mom in the Portland area, and they've already been doing these kinds of programs for years and years. And I was so impressed <laughs> with what that mom was telling me, and I was thinking about what um, what's being proposed and appears to be going forward here in Salem-Kaiser. So that's all good. So we have lots of opportun educational opportunities. Let's make sure every student has access to all of those <laughs> educational opportunities. And that's not the case today. And that's where we need to go because the individual student needs are different from one person to the other, from one student to the other, even within families. The, the educational um, needs are different and what will benefit an individual student is different from a brother or sister. So um, um, I want to We have one minute. One minute. <laughs> so, hey, what you haven't said that you need to say. <laughs> what do I need to say? Um, whatever you want my viewers to. <laughs> oh, well, I just want to thank you. To vote for you. <laughs> well, of course, yes, vote for me. I, I forget with, with this kind of programming, we can, we can do that. Yeah. Thank you, any listener who's already jumped on board to my campaign, volunteering, uh, supporting in any way, shape, or form. Thank you so much. It's much appreciated. And uh, yes, you can contact me uh, to learn more about my campaign. Can I say they can go to the yes. website? You can go to the website, pattymillenforsenate.com. Um, and uh, we'll put you to work. <laughs> but And thank you, Michael, for making this opportunity available. And that's what's so great about local <laughs> community television access. <laughs> thank you, Patty. Thanks.